특별한 게 그냥 놔둬도 괜찮을 것 같아, 그죠? 딱 여기 오른쪽 색깔하고 Okay, good morning. My name is Chung Wah Hong, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Korean American Service and Education Consortium. And next to me is Sung Chul Hong, a Research Specialist at NACASEC, and he'll be moderating the symposium with me, um, with the Korean language part of it. We're very pleased to welcome all of you to this symposium today with the theme, Defining Our Future Within Multi-Ethnic America. This is part of our third anniversary celebration event. Defining our future is an ambitious goal for a short symposium to address, but this is a subject that we felt must be addressed in a more substantive and coordinated fashion. For the past few years, we have been witnessing attacks on minority communities and immigrants that is unprecedented since the civil rights gains of the 1960s. The Immigration Reform Act, welfare reform, attacks on affirmative action, voting rights, and even citizenship rights by birth. When you put all of these together, a truly terrifying picture emerges. However, we saw a tremendous effort on the part of the minority communities during the last year's elections. It was the first national election since the sudden surge of anti-immigrant wave and where immigrant and mi minority issues were on the forefront. Um, fortunately, our communities rose up to meet the challenge, and there were active voter participation from especially Asian and Latino communities during the elections. In the Korean American community, the high voter turnout was unprecedented, and it really, um, the election participation served as an important turning point in the history of Korean American uh, immigration and empowerment. And partly due to this impressive show of political power and participation, immigrants made some gains, such as restoring uh, some of the important welfare benefits and winning some of the more conservative politicians over to more pro-immigrant positions. But the crisis is by no means over. A larger, more prolonged movement um, is building up that is attacking minority communities on a new level. Some manifestations include the recent formation of a national anti-immigrant coalition or the backlash against Asian Pacific Americans um, and their political participation in the last year's elections. So in many ways, last several years, um, a lot of a lot of us, different uh, minority communities, have been working to put out all these fires coming from different directions. But now, more than ever, we need to think about long-term strategies with a broad scope. This is one of the reasons why the title of this conference today is called Defining Our Future Within Multi-Ethnic America. It's no longer enough to say, as a minority, we are not included, we are invisible, we are not heard. We must be ready and also prepare our next generation to be ready to take on more leadership in this country that is torn by racism, poverty, immigrant scapegoating, and other deeply rooted problems. Without us, these problems cannot be addressed. 
In order to tackle those issues, we need to look at race relations and multi-ethnic coalition building and how it intersects with social, political, and economic justice issues. In addition, we need to be alert about how our society is changing and re-examine our strategies for how we can strengthen the voices of democracy amidst these changes. Our discussion needs to be intellectually rigorous as well as practically applicable. So towards that end, I hope that this forum will provoke and urge all of you in this room to take an active part in defining and shaping our future together. 아, 아, 안녕하세요. 아, 저는 어, 미주한인봉사교육단체협의회 야, 연구원으로 일하고 있는 홍성철입니다. 아, 제가 이런 큰 무대에 처음 서보는 거라서요. 좀 떨리는데요. 좀 아, 더듬거리도록 이해 좀 해주시기 바랍니다. 아, 바쁘신 와중에서 오늘 저희 그 미교육 설립 3주년 심포지움에 참석해주신 아, 많은 분들께 진심으로 감사드립니다. 아, 오늘 심포지움의 주제는 아, 다민족연대와 미주한인 커뮤니티 미래입니다. 우리는 지난 몇년 동안 이 땅에 거세게 몰아닥쳤던 반이민 공세와 소수민족에 대한 공격을 목격해 오고 있습니다. 이러한 이민자와 소수, 소수민족에 대한 차별은 지난 1960년대 민권운동 이래 유례가 없을 정도였습니다. 웰페어 개정안을 위시하여 개정이민법, 어포리브 액션 페이지, 심지어 이민자들이 투표권과 시민권을 공격하는 험악한 사태로 어, 진전되게 이루어졌습니다. 그러나 이러한 차별 공세에 어, 한인 커뮤니티를 비롯한 소수민족 커뮤니티는 적극적으로 대응해 나갔고 어, 합법 이민자 어, 이루, 어, 이러한 겨, 어, 그 대응의 결과로서 그 합법 이민자의 사회 보장 혜택이 대부분 복원되는 그런 큰 성과도 거둘 수 있었습니다. 어, 또한 작년 96년 11월 선거를 맞이하여 그, 아, 아, 아시안 아메리칸과 아, 라틴어 커뮤니티가 보여준 높은 선거 참여율과 정치적 각성은 아, 매우 인상적인 것이었습니다. 물론 하, 아, 한인 커뮤니티도 예외는 아니었습니다. 아, 지난, 96년, 아, 지난 96년 대통령 선거는 아, 한, 아, 한인 커뮤니티에게 있어 중요한 전환점을 이루었다는 것은 분명한 사실입니다. 아, 이로 인해 그 반이민의 공세가 한풀 꺾인 것은 사실이나 아, 아직 끝난 것은 아니며 어쩌면 더욱더 차별적이고 무지막지한 제2의 제3의 공세가 닥쳐올 징후들이 아, 나타나고 있습니다. 아, 그 대표적인 예로 요 아, 반이민 공세의 시작이었던 그 주민발의안 187을 아, 주도했던 세력들이 아, 최근 결성한 것을 알려지고 있는 그 반이민 연맹과 아, 지난 선거에서 그 선거자금 모음과 관련해 그 행해지고 있는 아시안 아메리칸에 대한 공격들이 바로 그런 것들이라 할수 있겠습니다. 이제 그 단기적 차원에서 우리는 급격히 몰려온 반이민 공세에 급한 불을 일단 어, 끄는 데 성공했습니다. 그러나 이제, 이제 우리는 앞으로 거세게 몰려올 그 더큰 공세에 올바르게 대응하기 위해서 이제 장기적인 전략과 사업 활동으로 임해야 될 시점에 와 있습니다. 그래서 그 오늘 심포지움의 주제를 어, 다민족 연대와 미, 어, 미주 한인 커뮤니티 미래라고 정하게 되었던 것입니다. 오늘 이 심포지움이 우리에게 다가온 이러한 시대적 과제를 같이 고민하고 토론하여 건설적인 대안을 함께 마련하는 계기가 되었으면 하는 바람입니다. 그리고 이 심포지움에 참석하신 모든 분들이 앞으로 커뮤니티 운명을 좌우할지도 모를 이 중요한 과제를 능동적으로 풀어나가는 주체들이 되었으면, 하는, 되었으면 합니다. And as we uh, move forward with our program, please bear with us. There are actually significant numbers of Korean uh, language speaking participants here. So we're going to do some of the moderation bilingually. And the panel presentations will be in English, but we have Korean language translated summaries available for some of them. Um, and the question and answer session will be uh, done bilingually. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to ask Dr. Sukhon Kim to share with us some welcoming remarks on behalf of NACASAC. He is our Vice President, um, Vice President of NACASAC, and we have benefited much from his wisdom and his lifelong dedication to the community since our founding and long before our founding. Um, so, Dr. Kim, but hold on one second. <laughs> 부기사장으로 계신 김수건 박사님께서 나오셔서 오늘 심포지움의 인사말을 해드리겠습니다. 
어, 김수범 박사님을 박수로 맞이해 주시면 고맙겠습니다. 나카스엑스 uh, third anniversary symposium. As a young organization, we made uh, great uh, strides and experienced much growth these past uh, few years. We are grateful that many of those who have uh, supported us are uh, here today. Three years ago, the founders of NACASAC pledged to initiate programs, activities that would be very vital to meet the uh, needs and concerns of Korean Americans on national level. At that time, immigrant rights were the overriding issue. Since then, we have come to address many other civil rights issues, such as affirmative action, border education, and uh, anti-Asian prejudice and violence. As you are aware, America is changing demographically in a very drastic uh, fashion. The population of uh, ethnic minorities, including Asian Pacific Americans, is surging. At the same time, Ethnic minorities are also becoming prominent, more prominent in arts, culture, politics, education, economy, and the government. Uh, maybe I should include sports as well. Michael Chang, Chano Park, Irabu, and uh, who is Tiger Woods? <laughs> As Korean Americans, we must play an important role and reaching out and establishing a strong, harmonious relations with other ethnic communities. It is for this reason we have chosen defining our future within multi-ethnic America as uh, the theme of uh, this year's symposium. We have many fine speakers here to discuss and reflect on the importance of uh, multi-ethnic uh, coalition building in the coming century. I thank all of them for joining us this morning. And I would also like to uh, Thank uh, Chun Ji and uh, Billy Young of uh, Bell Atlantic for their uh, hospitality and uh, support in sponsoring uh, this good event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, now I'd like to introduce Chun Ji from Bell Atlantic. Bell Atlantic has provided this wonderful space and the breakfast that we all enjoyed. And it, it is with June's leadership that Bell Atlantic is able to support so many important projects, and especially in the Asian Pacific American community, including the symposium and the evening banquet. So June, would you just share with us a couple of words? 
그럼 다음 대한 아틀란틱 전화회사의 준지 씨께서 나오셔서 환영의 말을 해주시겠습니다. 벨 아틀란틱 전화회사는 바로 어, 여러분이 계신 이 쾌적한 그 심포지엄 장소예요. 오늘 맛있게 드신 그 아침 식사를 제공해 주셨습니다. 다시 한번 존지 씨에게 깊은 감사를 드립니다. 여러분 존지 씨를 뜨거운 박수로 환영해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, first, good morning to everybody. On behalf of the new Bell Atlantic, I welcome you to our headquarters. Um, we are very proud to support this very thought-provoking symposium because we have to think of us not as the minority, but rather as the new majority, because that's who we are today. Um, we're also very happy and, and very proud to support NACASAC's third anniversary celebration. Um, our participation in this event demonstrates that even though our name has changed from 9X to Bell Atlantic, our commitment remains steadfast with the community. So again, on behalf of Bell Atlantic, we would like to extend our congratulations to Chung Hua, the board of directors, the staff, all as volunteers and all those associated with NACASAC for their commitment to the uh, community in whole. Again, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, 이렇게 그 의미 있고 중요한 행사를 어, 개, 개최하기 위해서 매우 기쁘게 생각하고요. 그리고 그, 아, 그 벨, 아, 아틀란틱 회사로 이름이 바뀌더라도 지역사회에 어, 이런 좋은 행사나 지역사회에 대한 그, 어, 지원은 계속 하시겠다고 말씀하셨습니다. 그리고 어, 이, 오늘 이 행사를 어, 준비해 주신 낙하색 스텝 발런티어 모든 분들에게 어, 격려의 말을 전하고 싶으시답니다. Thanks, June. To my left are panelists who bring us knowledge, analysis, and rich experiences from their communities. We could not have asked for a better group of panelists than the ones that we have uh, today to address the topic that we're exploring. They are activist, scholar, author, educator, all in one. And most of all, they care deeply about the communities uh, and our nation. We asked them to prepare talks on the status of their respective communities in the first part of their presentation, and also um, make some specific proposals or recommendations um, for effective multi-ethnic coalition building. We also ask you in the audience to actively participate during the question and answer and the discussion session that will follow the panel. 네, 그 시간 관계상 이분에 대한 어, 통역은 어, 생략하겠는데요. 그 연사 분들의 양력이 그 프로그램 지 8페이지에 나와 있습니다. 그래서 그걸 어, 발제를 들으시거나 그러시면서 참조하시면 되겠습니다. Now it is great pleasure. Um... With great pleasure, that I introduce our first speaker, Juan Gonzalez. His detailed uh, biography can be found inside of this booklet on page nine. Um, he is a, a preeminent columnist with the Daily News. He has written on some of the most um, controversial and important issues um, that our society faces today. And he's also an editor and contributor to numerous other periodicals and magazines. He has just won a whole bunch of countless awards, um, which you can read about in the program book. Um, he has also produced, um, co-produced award-winning 1992 PBS documentary, Haiti, Killing the Dream. He has this wonderful book out called um, Roll Down Your Window, uh, right here. If you're interested in purchasing it, please let us know. Um, and he's also in, in the process of writing another book on the Latino community. Uh, very much uh, of an overview piece, and we all look forward to uh, reading that one as well. So it's, it's, we are very privileged to have Juan. So thank you for being with us, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, or? Hello, is that better? Yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, Nakasak for inviting me, and uh, I feel privileged to be able to try to share some of the the, the, the knowledge that I've gained from the, of the Latino community in the United States and how uh, 
the role that the Latino community plays in the overall situation of the changing uh, America. And I think that the, first of all, to, to, to put the Latino community into perspective, what is happening in the United States is not much different from what is happening throughout the advanced industrial world. Uh, whether it's France trying to cope with uh, the changing nature of its population as more Algerians and North Africans enter that country, whether it's England trying to deal with Pakistanis and Jamaicans and Indians, whether it's Germany and the Turks and the uh, Vietnamese, uh, all of the industrial West, and whether it's the United States with the increasing populations of Asians uh, and West Indians and Latin Americans, the reality is that the industrial world in the last 50 years has undergone momentous changes in its population. The basic thing that is happening is that the third world is moving to the West, to the advanced West. Uh, this is being caused by several factors. Among those factors are the growing gap in income levels between the third world and the West, uh, where the ability to sustain the kind of life that people are seeing on their television sets, because wherever you go in, in any backwater town in Honduras, uh, or in the Dominican Republic, uh, or in Southeast Asia, increasing numbers of people through television are seeing America, uh, and seeing the kind of standard of living that exists there, uh, but then they see the reality of what they face. Uh, and the changes and advances in communications and transportation, uh, or the communications is making America visible to the world, uh, and transportation is making its advances in transportation is making it so much easier to get to the United States. Uh, and then the increasing penetration of American companies throughout the world causing tremendous changes and dislocations in the economies of those countries. So that there is an irreversible tide occurring in the world that is not going to change no matter what laws are created. Uh, the question is how the United States, France, England, and Germany uh, deal with the growing changes uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their, their populations. Uh, so the Latino is, uh, experience is just a subset of that experience. What makes it particularly dif distinct in relationship to the United States is that you have the largest English-speaking country in the world side by side with the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Grasp that. Mexico is the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. It has 95 million people, dwarfing Spain or any other country in Latin America. And so you have a third world country, the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world, sharing a 2,000-mile border with the largest English-speaking country in the world. The Latino experience in America, and I'm a Puerto Rican who's been raised in this country since 1947, uh, and, uh, but the reality is, that the Latino experience in the United States is largely the Mexican experience. While all other nationalities and groups are critical, the Mexican experience is dominant. Why is that? There are approximately 26 million uh, Hispanics in the United States uh, as of the 1994 midterm census count. Of those uh, 26 million, 17 million, or 63 percent, are Mexican origin. Uh, the Puerto Ricans, uh, uh, my population is second at 2.7 million, and Cubans at 1.1 million, uh, Central and South Americans at approximately 3.7 million, and other Hispanics, who I think are largely Dominicans, uh, come in at about 1.9 million. So that Mex the Mexican experience is the, is the is the dominant experience uh, of Hispanics in the United States, and is the oldest experience. And I think that that is critical to grasp also. Uh, in a country where we're so concerned about language uh, and, cult and historical and cultural origins, few Americans have paid attention sufficiently enough in their history courses, or at least the history courses were not sufficiently uh, uh, open enough to, uh, to talk about the, the origins of the United States. And whether you look at Montana, which is the Spanish word for mountain, montaña, or Nevada, which is the Spanish word for snow, uh, the whole west and southwestern parts of the United States uh, were taken from Mexico in the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. 
uh, California, Texas, the whole, the whole Sun Belt of which so much of American development uh, in the, in, since the 1950s has concentrated on uh, was largely all a Mexican territory. Most of the major American cities now, whether San Diego, Los Angeles, San Antonio, Dallas, Phoenix, uh, these are all in the top 10 populations of American cities, uh, were all part of the Mexican uh, territory in the Southwest uh, that was uh, half of the territory of Mexico that was seized in the, in the Mexican-American War. Uh, as a result, there are sections of the United States, and I specifically always like to refer to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, because very few Americans venture down that far, the Brownsville, McAllen, um, Rio Grande City, Corpus Christi. Uh, that whole section of, of the United States below San Antonio has been a majority Mexican and Spanish speaking since it became part of the United States, long before uh, when uh, in some places of South Texas, 90% of the population of all the counties is Mexican American. And these are people who date their existence in that territory from uh, uh, the time of Escandon, the colonizer uh, who settled that whole area in the, in the early 1700s. Uh, and so virtually when you say, and I'm not talking about a small territory, the old Nueces Strip as they called it, uh, uh, it takes four hours to drive from San Antonio to Brownsville, south, straight south, four hours drive. That's like from here to Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a territory as large as Connecticut New and New Jersey combined. And it is an area that has always been majority Mexican-American, Spanish-speaking, uh, and to this day. Uh, and uh, so that the myth that the United States has been a monolingual country depends on what part of the territory you happen to start your big start from. Uh, so the Mexican experience obviously is a, the oldest experience. Next comes the Puerto Rican experience which begins really with the Spanish-American War of 1898 and the conquest uh, and occupation of Puerto Rico to this day. Next year it will be 100 years that Puerto Rico has been a colony of the United States. It is the oldest and largest colony that the United States still possesses, although of course in Hawaii there's a movement that is questioning whether uh, statehood is a really a valid issue, but, uh, but uh, certainly uh, in terms of direct territories of the United States, Puerto Rico has now for nearly 100 years been a, uh, a, a, a territory possession or colony of the United States, still unresolved, questions still unresolved, what will happen to Puerto Rico? Uh, and uh, uh, those who know Hawaiian history know how long the Hawaiians even tried to get statehood before it was granted. The only problem with the Puerto Ricans is the changes in the populations of Hawaii rapidly changed so that there were large numbers of uh, non-Hawaiians who dominated in the population. 100 years after Puerto Rico became a territory of the United States, there are 3.7 million people in the population, and if there is 1% Anglo, uh, it's a lot. It's overwhelmingly still a Puerto Rican uh, island. It hasn't changed, but it's still Spanish-speaking. Because of that, the United States does not know what to do with it. Uh, but it's still a possession and an embarrassment. So those are, those are, you have the two oldest populations. Most of the other Latino populations have come to the United States since the 1960s. Uh, most of them have come as a result of major dislocations in their own countries. In the 60s came the Cubans and the Dominicans. The Cubans came fleeing uh, largely uh, uh, middle class and upper class peoples fleeing a, uh, uh, a left wing revolution. The Dominicans basically uh, intellectuals and middle class people fleeing a, 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 a failed attempt to bring back President Juan Bosch uh, in 1965. Most of the Dominicans who came here were left-wing in their orientation. They were admitted to the United States because the United States was seeking to end the dislocations in the Dominican Republic. And so in, in the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of Cubans and Dominicans entered the United States. In the 70s, you started having large numbers of Salvadorans and Colombians entering the United States, both of them because of major dislocations that were occurring in their countries. Uh, in Colombia, all attention is paid to the drug war, but Colombia had had the longest running civil, uh, civil war going on of all of Latin America now for many years, creating tremendous dislocation uh, in the country. And uh, the Salvadorans likewise. 
uh, in the 80s, you started having the large numbers of Nicaraguans, uh, uh, Hondurans, and other nationalities that started coming to the country. Uh, so that each of these groups came at different times, but also went to different parts of the country. And this is one of the things that is unusual, because ignorance, prejudice, uh, breeds, uh, uh, breeds on generalities. Stereotypes, ignorance, and prejudice really breeds on generalities. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding uh, uh, emerges from understanding the particular realities of different people. Uh, and their attempt to lump all Hispanics and all Latinos together as attempts to lump all Asian and Pacific Islanders together. Uh, even now, the black population, which is increasingly differentiated by the growing numbers of West Indian blacks that have come to the country, change that nature of that population. But that ignorance uh, is where stereotypes breed. So that every Latino group that has come to this country has come for different reasons, has come from different classes of their own population have settled in different parts of the country uh, and have different racial compositions so that, so that they fall on the racial spectrum in one way or another. Uh, and uh, for instance, the Mexican experience has very little knowledge of uh, other than Indian white mestizo, whereas among Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans, there is much more of a black mulatto uh, uh, as well as Indian uh, 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 Spaniard population. So there's a greater understanding on the part of Puerto Ricans and, 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 and Dominicans about the black experience than there is perhaps among Mexicans or even Salvadorans or some other nationalities. So that you've got, you've got to see the, the, the particular reality. The other thing that I'd like to raise a lot, which is often forgotten in this issue of, of immigration, is that there was a great process of penetration of, of, of Americans into Latin America long before Latin Americans came here. Many of the great fortunes of Americans, of Americans, famous Americans, were built in Latin America. Uh, one example that I like to often raise is H.O. Havemeyer, because those of you who know Columbia University and Havemeyer Hall, uh, it, Havemeyer was a sugar refiner uh, who built his fortune basically building the sugar trust uh, uh, in Cuba. Uh, Minor Keith, who built the Costa Rican Railroad uh, in the uh, late 1800s, basically using uh, Chinese and West Indian labor that he imported from both sides to build the Costa Rica Railroad, and eventually united with Lorenzo Dow Preston's Boston Fruit Company to create one of the great octopuses of Latin American history, the United Fruit Company. Uh, Minor Keith is another example. Uh, the Stillman family, uh, uh, First National City Bank, of fame started with Charles Stillman, who who sent uh, uh, who went to uh, Matamoros, Mexico, in the 1830s and began a trading operation. Eventually, did some riverboat work up and down the Rio Grande, became a landowner. And Don Carlos Stillman's son, James Stillman, eventually became the head of the National City Bank. But the fortune was built by the family uh, in the Mexican territory uh, of South Texas. Uh, the Bass family, the Bass family uh, uh, began its uh, uh, heyday by buying a huge uh, sugar plantation in the Dominican Republic, which eventually became the biggest sugar plantation in the world, Central Romana, uh, eventually turned over to Gulf and Western, and is now, of course, the famous Casa de Campo. Uh, uh, any of you who have ever been to that famous resort, Dominican Republic. Uh, so that you have a tremendous number of American families, the W.R. Grace Company, uh, an Irish immigrant who went to Peru uh, in the early 1800s looking for guano deposits uh, and started a trading company which became uh, a, the famous W.R. Grayson Company. So all of these companies went down there, made huge fortunes, brought it back to the United States, uh, and, um, and, so you, and it's continuous to this day. So that this immigration story is rarely told of all the wealth that was made in Latin America. Uh, by uh, American families, not just companies, but there were people who owned these companies. Uh, and, uh, and now there's a tremendous uh, uproar about the Latin Americans who are coming here uh, to try to make a living. Uh, so I think that these are some of the historical particularities that need to be further addressed. Uh, this anti-immigrant wave is not new. And this is the third major anti-immigrant wave this country has been through. The first one was in the 1850s against the Irish with the Know Nothing Party. 
The second ones were in the 1920s against the uh, East, uh, South, Southern Europeans, and uh, and now we have the, and of course there was another interlude, about a million Mexicans were deported in the 1950s uh, back uh, to Mexico, so, but now we're in the, the third major anti-immigrant wave in the United States. The problem with this anti-immigrant wave is it has no basis in common sense. The United States, England, France, and Germany have a problem that their populations are growing old because of World War II and the tremendous problem that it created in taking away millions of people. The average age, the median age in most of these countries is in the high 30s and early 40s. In another 10, 15 years, all of England, all of Germany, all of the United States is gonna be entering senior citizenhood as far as the white population is concerned. Uh, all those countries need young laborers to operate, to run the countries. And in another 10, 15 years, it's really gonna become a crisis. The only source of young labor that exists is in the third world. So that this temporary anti-immigrant wave makes no sense when you study the demographic trends. The country's gonna become increasingly third world, has no choice but to do that. The question is, how is it going to be dealt with uh, in terms of the, the social institutions of the society and how the society is going to uh, understand that America has always been a, a nation in the process of becoming. It's always been changing. That's change is part of the uh, change in the size of the country, change in, in how the laws have been applied, and change in the composition of the people. America is a country always in the process of defining itself and redefining itself. But some people cling to old ideas. They prefer uh, what, the, that, what they know versus what they don't know. And so I think that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a bright future ahead for immigrants as well as non-immigrants. Just a question of understanding our history, understanding where we're going, and figuring out the best way to cope with it. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, 죄송합니다. 그 제가 간단하게 서머리를 요약해서 말씀드리겠습니다. 그 주로 그 어, 미국 변화에 있어서의 라틴어 커뮤니티 역할에 대해서 말씀해 주셨는데요. 그 지금 어, 선진 어, 제3세계 국가에서 선진 산업 국가로 인구들이 예, 이동하고 있습니다. 어, 그 이후로는 그 선진 산업 국가 제3세계 국가들에서 벌어지고 있는 그 어, 빈부의 격차, 그러니까 인감 수준이나 그 다음에 그, 그 커뮤니케이션이 발달이라든지요. 또 미국 회사가 세계로 진출하면서 이런 제3세계 국가들에서 선진 산업 국가로 이동이 일어나고 있으며 이러한 것이 이제 이민의 배경이 되고 있습니다. 어, 그래서 또, 또한 선진 산업국은 이러한 것으로 인해서 이제 그 인구 변동을 어, 어, 급격한 인구 변동을 경험하고 있습니다. 그래서 그 다음에는요 주로 그 어, 미국에서의 그 어, 라틴어 커뮤니티 라틴어인들의 경험에 대해서 말씀해 주셨습니다. 어, 미국 라틴어 커뮤니티 경험은 주로 그 가장 어, 오래됐으며 또 주, 주, 어, 주도적인 것은 이제 멕시코, 멕시코인들인데요. 그 이유는 이제 멕시코인, 어, 멕시코인들, 멕시코 이민자가 다, 그 미국 라틴어 인구의 다수를 점하고 있기 때문이죠. 어, 그리고 그, 그, 이런 그 초창기에 멕시코 이민들이 많이 왔고요. 그 다음에 이제 한, 어, 그 다음에 또 하나가 이제 포, 포에토리코인들이 이제 미국에 이민 온 것에 대해서 말씀해 주셨습니다. 그리고 이제 1960년대 이후에 아, 그 쿠바나 도미니칸이나 이런 데서 이제 주, 중산층을 중심으로 아, 미국의 정치적인 이유나 이런 걸로 어, 오게 된 배경에 대해 말씀해 주셨습니다. 아, 그, 그, 그 외에도 이제 1970년대에 살바도르나 콜롬비아, 니카라바 이런 데서 이제 이민을 오게 된 것에 말씀 좋습니다. 그래서 이 모든 그 시대별로 예그 라틴어 커뮤니티 이민이 예, 다른 시간과 아 그리고 다른 나라에서 그리고 이민은 이민 오게 된 이유도 다른 이유에서 이제 오게 된 거라고 말씀하셨습니다. 어그 그리고 어, 반이민 공세 잠깐 언급하셨는데요. 지금 선진 산업국이 미국과 영국 같은 선진 산업국이 이제 인구가 노령화되고 있기 때문에 2차 세계 대전의 영향으로 아, 젊은 그 노동력이 필요한데 이러한 에도 불구하고 바, 아, 이민자를 차별하는 반응의 공세가 일어난다는 것은 아, 말이 안 된다고 얘기하셨습니다. 네. 
Thanks, Mr. Gonzalez. His um, talk was reminding me of this banner I saw at a rally, immigrant rights rally. It said, um, presumably by undocumented immigrants, it said, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us. So um, that, that just made a really strong impression on me. Um, uh, I think that kind of sums up uh, the first half of his talk. Um, and you know, at, at this time, um, I think it was really great that we learned a lot about the Latino community. And I would like to uh, ask Juan to still think about making a couple of uh, recommendations, uh, perhaps uh, to tell us during the question and answer time in terms of what the community groups can do to enhance relationship with the Latino community or to pursue effective coalition building. Um, it could be um, examples for student groups or nonprofit groups or um, whatever. Um, moving on to the Asian American community, I think you'll see a lot of similarities uh, between Latino and Asian American communities uh, because of all the diversity and um, the different challenges that we have uh, within our, our, our communities. Um, to address, to talk about the Asian American community, we have Margaret Fung, the Executive Director of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, she has been a, uh, a great friend of our organization, um, but more important than that, she has been a leading activist um, and also the founding member of, the, uh, of All Deaf, which is the first legal organization um, that helps to protect Asian Americans through protect the civil rights of Asian Americans through litigation and uh, education and advocacy. Um, she graduated from Gar Barnard College and she has honorary degrees uh, from CUNY Law School, NYU Law School I believe also, and she's very active in various sectors, uh, not just Asian Americans. So we're very, very happy to have her and um, over 20 years of experience um, in the Asian American community. Thank you so much for being here, Margaret. Thanks, thanks very much, Chung Wah. Um, you know, Asian American Legal Defense Fund um, has worked for many years with Young Korean American Service and Education Center here um, in Flushing, Queens, doing legal advice clinics. So we really have appreciated working with you and to see the new development of NACASEC. Um, as you all know, this year President Clinton named a new advisory panel on race. Um, we're all wondering where that commission is going to be going. Um, it is a racially diverse group, and as you know, Angela O, oh, a Korean American attorney from Los Angeles, is a member of that panel. And if you may recall, after the first meeting of the group, um, after the announcement in, in San Diego, but when they first met in Washington, D.C., um, Angela O oh had apparently mentioned uh, an issue about how she hoped the commission would go beyond the black-white paradigm of race relations and how we would need to talk about um, other kinds of issues. Um, it was reported in the media as sort of a mini dispute. I don't know because I wasn't there, uh, I, but I did hear that there was uh, some talk about whether or not the panel should be focusing primarily on African Americans in the civil rights movement or whether the debate should be expanded uh, to include uh, other communities of color. Um, I think the problem is that the media has represented once again the notion of African Americans and Korean Americans uh, in dispute, having disagreements. When what the issue is really about and the one that we need to work very consciously uh, to overcome is how we can work together to expand the dialogue to be sure that all of our communities are included in a discussion about how we will resolve long-standing problems of racism in our society. Um, for the past three decades, Asian immigration has been a major factor in transforming America into a more racially and ethnically diverse society. Um, as the nation's Asian American population uh, has expanded now to 9.7 million, the debate over multiculturalism has especially raised a lot of questions, especially with Asian Americans, with our diverse cultures, languages, and class backgrounds and how we're going to find common ground with other communities of color in the struggle for racial, social, and economic justice. Um, we've all been well aware of this stereotype of the model minority. Uh, we've done a lot in the past two decades, I think, to try to overcome 
and expand upon what is a, some people's view, a positive stereotype. But we continue to hear now, once again, especially as we uh, enter the debate on affirmative action and the role of Asian Americans in such programs, we continue to hear a lot of census statistics uh, that Asian Americans have the highest median family income, the highest percentage of college graduates, the highest percentage of workers um, uh, in professional and managerial jobs. And I think as a community, we should be proud of the individual accomplishments that we have all witnessed among our families and friends. But we need to remember that this model minority stereotype does not apply to all segments of our community, um, especially as the diversity of our community uh, increases. Uh, for example, Southeast Asian refugees um, are disproportionately higher on public assistance. There's the poverty rates for Asian Americans in Los Angeles and New York City are still higher than for the white population. We're all aware of the history of legalized discrimination against Asian Americans dating back to the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 19th century, uh, the laws that prevented us from owning land, testifying in courts of law, the laws that kept us from becoming US citizens and thereby prevented us from voting until 1943, and in some instances as late as 1952. And of course, during World War II, the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans in camps who were forcibly uprooted from their homes remains one of the largest <coughs> and most significant violations of civil, li civil liberties in our nation's history. But now the debate is moving to the notion that discrimination against Asian Americans is really a thing of the past. It's a historical phenomenon, but now we've overcome it. And of course, that is hardly the case. Um, the Glass Ceiling Commission reported, for example, um, and this was a commission created under President Bush, bipartisan commission, found that Asian Americans, as well as other communities of color, still face the glass ceiling. So if you look at the top Fortune 500 companies, 95% of executives are white, uh, the numbers of Asian Americans that are holding top-ranking managerial positions is not, does not even reach 1%. It's a fraction of 1%. Um, the anti-immigrant sentiment, I think, though, is the major factor that's affecting our community. Um, new restrictive federal welfare laws, as well as restrictions on immigration policies, have really created a crisis for all low-income people, and especially for legal immigrants in our community. Um, a sector of our community that is disproportionately borne the burden of the cuts, the budget cuts in welfare programs. Um, there are still few opportunities for immigrants to enter the workforce, especially those with limited job skills and li limited English proficiency. And many Asian Americans are still trapped in low paying jobs in restaurants, garment factories, the electronics industry, small businesses. <coughs> Yet the rights of all workers are going to be undermined by the welfare to work policies that have been encompassed now uh, in the new welfare law. And it's unclear whether people who are moving from welfare to work, the new, uh, the new concept that's being promoted uh, around the country, whether these workers are going to be paid minimum wage or have basic health and safety protections. One new thing that's coming up in the debate is that if you talk about racism or you point out to the inequities that you, your community faces, um, we're criticized as, as saying that we're victims, we're part of a uh, victim mentality. Um, part of the problem is that, uh, in fact, there is a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Uh, sometimes we actually are the victims of racially, motive, uh, racially motivated violence and harassment. Um, in a recent report uh, issued by the National Asian Pacific American Legal Consortium, um, of which we are a part, um, and in conjunction with the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco and the Asian Pacific American Legal Center in Los Angeles, um, there was a 17% rise in anti-Asian violence and incidents of uh, vandalism and harassment, uh, even though nationwide there was a 7% drop in violent crime. Um, here in New York City, uh, the statistics actually are even worse. There was a 34% there increase in hate crimes against Asian. And unfortunately, uh, many of the perpetrators identified were police officers. There's also been an increase in police brutality um, around the country. Um, 
recently we were involved in a case uh, representing, uh, actually we're currently involved in a case representing some Asian American students who were beaten up outside a Denny's restaurant in Syracuse. Um, we're, it was basically a multiracial group. Uh, six Asian Americans, three African Americans, and their white companion have sued Denny's because they were denied restaurant service. Um, and then the deputy sheriffs who worked for the county um, uh, wrongfully uh, ejected the students from the restaurant. And then when they were in the parking lot outside the restaurant, they were beaten up by a gang of white youth. Um, even though the attackers were identified uh, by several of the students, uh, the Syracuse district attorney refused to make any arrests, even though he knows some of the attackers by name. And this is what he said. He said, the incident is orchestrated nonsense. There is no evidence that any of this related to ethnic origins of the students. Uh, people have to manufacture these kinds of claims of racism in order to justify their existence. This is a theme that we're beginning to hear more and more, discounting the fact that racism exists even when people <coughs> suffer injuries. Um, as immigrants increasingly become naturalized citizens and Know that NACASEC and many community groups are working uh, as quickly as we can to be sure that everyone who is uh, eligible becomes a naturalized citizen, um, we will continue to become more actively involved in the political process. Um, voting rights laws, uh, which have recently come under attack by conservatives, uh, really must be strengthened to deal with uh, new communities of interest that reflect a new multi-ethnic context. Um, Increasing our voter registration rates, educating ourselves about candidates, positions on issues that are of importance to our community, um, ensuring greater voter turnout on election day, and running as candidates ourselves are just a few aspects of this process. But I would also encourage you all to become more actively engaged in the substance of campaign finance reform, um, because at this period of time, the role of big money in politics has clearly fostered cynicism and alienation among all voters. Um, I think many of us would not have cared very much about campaign finance reform, except that our community and Asian Americans have been dragged into the spotlight as a result of the practices of a few individuals in last year's um, elections. Uh, but as you all know, uh, when the congressional hearings actually began, uh, some with the notion that we should uh, be thinking about trying to reform the political process, um, we didn't hear much discussion, we still haven't heard much discussion about how we want to change the political process to make it work better for everyone. Um, instead, we began to hear, uh, I guess with Senator Fred Thompson in the opening of the Senate hearings, we heard some exaggerated charges of a Chinese conspiracy to influence White House policies, uh, a charge for which even to this date there's been no proof offered. And we once again heard a spate of anti-Asian remarks. Um, such as that from the Republican Senator of Kansas, Senator Brownback, who described John Wong's fundraising job in fractured English, saying, no raise money, no get bonus. Um, we've heard all kinds of twists and turns on old and Asian <coughs> themes, and of course, many of you um, around the country uh, joined demonstrations against National Review, uh, the conservative publication that ran a caricature of the Clintons and Gore with slanted eyes, uh, colored <coughs> hats, uh, exaggerated features, something which is highly offensive uh, to Asian Americans, uh, but also harkens back to the kinds of illustrations and images that were used in the 19th century to stir up anti-immigrant hysteria, led to lynchings, uh, and led ultimately to the kind of legislation which kept Asians out of this country for almost a century. Uh, NACASEC was among uh, several of the national groups that filed a complaint with the US Civil Rights Commission recently uh, documenting a pattern of actions by members of Congress, the Republican and Democratic parties, and certain news media uh, uh, based on their actions and statements that have contributed to a hostile environment uh, for Asian Americans. Um, what this points out, I think, is that even after 150 years being in this country, we're still perceived as foreigners. Um, the most common remark that we will often hear is, uh, if it's negative remark, we're told to go back to where we came from, that's the most often used racial slur that occurs when anti-Asian violence um, is taking place. Um, or we are, our ability to English is, uh, is mocked uh, in cruel jokes, or sometimes those of us who speak perfectly fluent English will be, will be asked, well, how, where did you learn to speak English so well? 
Um, it also comes at a time uh, when we're seeing now, once again, an increase in English-only ordinances, um, English-only practices in the workplace, which affect not only Asian Americans, but also Latinos. Um, but ordinances that appear to be neutral, for example, in Palisades Park, New Jersey, uh, here on the East Coast, uh, there was previously a sign ordinance requiring English to be included on business signs. But there are also a number of zoning ordinances, um, business, business hours, uh, ordinances that would require certain businesses to close, but if you looked at where those ordinances were being applied, 95% of the businesses affected were Korean American. Um, I just want to comment on one last general trend uh, that I think we as Asian Americans need to pay particular attention to, and that is um, the way in which the conservatives, the right-wing um, uh, uh, groups and individuals have actually used our community as a wedge group, especially to attack affirmative action programs. Um, the one thing that's always most disturbing to me is to see a debate, um, it's very often on TV or you can read in the newspaper, and there will be African American, and uh, very often Ward Connolly from California, who is opposed um, affirmative action, and a defender of affirmative action programs. And we will hear ourselves being talked about. We will be told by others that we are uh, not going to benefit from affirmative action, that it actually hurts us, uh, that, uh, that white liberals are not standing up for Asian Americans. This is a recurring theme now, and I think Clearly, there is a debate that needs to take place within our own community, an honest debate about what it means to have affirmative action, in what context is it appropriate, when do we really need it, and what and can we go beyond our own self-interest in some instances to take positions which are important for the diversity of, for example, an educational environment or for our community, or to open up opportunities for everyone. Um, I think we need to monitor very carefully uh, what policymakers, uh, some of whom have no grassroots base, are saying about issues which are going to be of concern to us. Um, finally, um, in terms of what we should be doing together as multiracial coalitions, I think we only need to go back and look at some of the many examples that have occurred around the country. Um, in, in California, around Proposition 209, uh, numerous groups came together from all segments of the population, and I was very glad to see very many Asian American student groups um, leading many of the demonstrations against Prop 209. Um, legal groups uh, from the uh, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund to the Asian Pacific American uh, legal, legal Center, um, the AIC Fund, we'll talk about this, um, have challenged uh, the constitutionality of Proposition 209 and have supported um, other efforts to be sure that affirmative action remains a viable remedy to deal with past discrimination. Um, here in New York City, uh, just last month, uh, Asian Americans joined Haitian Americans, African Americans, and Latinos in a massive demonstration on City Hall to protest police brutality against Abner Louima, the Haitian immigrant who was beaten up in a Brooklyn police station. Um, we fought together, um, Asian Americans and Latinos, for multiracial voting districts. Um, here in New York City, uh, the 12th Congressional District, which led to the election of the first Puerto Rican woman, uh, was supported by many Asian American groups, um, in part because Asian Americans are a large proportion of this Congressional District, but also because we share many common concerns regarding uh, access to uh, bilingual services, education. Um, we've worked uh, for many years together on issues of voting rights. Uh, right now, in, since 1992, uh, Asian Americans across the country, around 200,000, are entitled to bilingual ballots and voting materials. We would have not achieved this uh, major gain had it not been for Latino civil rights groups that had come forward in 1975 to be sure that there would be minority language assistance. Um, as a result of the 1992 amendments that were passed by Congress, Chinese Americans in New York City for the first time have bilingual ballots, and yet there are still no Korean language ballots or assistance here in New York City despite the growing population. This is an issue that we need to join together to work on. Um, there are many other issues that unite people of color, and I think we need to remember that the civil rights gains of the 1960s was not the result of the work of any particular group. It was the joint movement of many people of goodwill coming together. Racism is really the unfinished business of our American democracy, and we need to reaffirm our moral commitment to these issues and find ways in which we can 
work together with people of different races, languages, and cultures to overcome these effects of racism. Thanks, Margaret. It's very clear that Asian Pacific Americans, although um, we are relatively smaller in number, have a pivotal role um, on how on, on the effective formation of multi coalition, um, coalition multi ethnic coalitions, or um, kind of unity among um, different groups in the United States. Um, and before I switch over to our next speaker, I just want to read you this one quote uh, by an Asian American scholar. Uh, he says, race is no longer literally a black or white matter. It is increasingly clear that the word minority means more than black, and American means more than white. And I think our first two speakers made that very clear along with uh, uh, over a dozen um, civil rights issue areas that I hope especially the students will go back and learn more about. And now we come to our <coughs> next speaker, um, Ted Shaw. He is um, Associate Director and Counsel at the NAACP, an organization that needs no introduction as, as it's the nation's oldest legal organization uh, fighting for civil rights and equal rights under law. Um, he has litigated many civil rights cases throughout his career. Um, he has been active in, in, in uh, New York City as a native. Um, he went to, he graduated from the NYU Law School and currently serves on the boards, uh, Board of Trustees of Wesleyan University, of uh, organizations such as Poverty, Race, uh, Research Action, Action Council, and, and many, many other uh, areas. And we are very, very glad to have him and also um, uh, bring with him his experiences from the NAACP. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, it's very good to be here with you this morning. I want to thank uh, Chung Wah Hong for inviting me and and I'm Sec for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I uh, do have to clarify two things. One is that the organization for which I work was started by the NAACP, uh, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, the NAACP was formed in 1909, and out of the NAACP grew the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which was established under the direction of the late Justice Thurgood Marshall uh, in 1940. But the Legal Defense Fund became entirely separate from the NAACP, uh, first for tax reasons and then uh, just grew to be independent. There's a lot of confusion about that, so I don't actually work for the NAACP. I work for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. People say, well, why is that your name if you're not part of the NAACP? And I said, well, most people, when you're born, you get your parents' name, and then as you become an adult, you become independent. You may not be your mother, or you're not your mother and your father, but you hold that name until you give it up. And, and sometimes you never give it up. So uh, I just want to clarify that. And um, also one small error of omission, which is not as slight to me at all, uh, and that's that I, I didn't graduate from NYU Law School. I don't want to make a false uh, <laughs> statement. There's a lot of dropouts on our panel. <laughs> I, uh, I graduated from, uh, from Columbia Law School, but NYU was a fine law school. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just returned. Oh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, George Mayaka is here in the audience. And when I, um, uh, when I got the invitation to speak here a few days later, I got a call. And uh, Mr. Mayaka, I, I hadn't met him, but he told me that he was a graduate of Wesleyan University, my undergraduate institution. And uh, so I look forward to meeting him here. And we did meet 
outside. I want to acknowledge his presence because I'm always glad to meet one of my fellow alums. Uh, so uh, raise your hand and let folks know who you are. <laughs> I just returned from Little Rock, Arkansas. I was in Little Rock where uh, President Clinton spoke on Thursday to acknowledge the 40th anniversary of the Little Rock school crisis. Now, the Little Rock school crisis was a singular event in American constitutional jurisprudence because it produced one of the most important and significant decisions in constitutional law, which reaffirmed the role of the judiciary. But it was also a crisis which stands on its own as an important moment in recent American history uh, because the question presented there was whether the nation was going to enforce the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education that required public school desegregation. And most of you are familiar with the pictures of the federal troops that escorted in the Little Rock Nine. If you hadn't been before, you probably saw something about it on the news in the last few days. President Clinton gave a speech in Little Rock about how America was changing. But at the same time, we had unfinished business. He said, and he's correct, of course, that we cannot look at the race problem in America through the prism of the old black-white paradigm that we're not a black and white nation, and indeed we never were. But that old perspective is not one that we can completely ignore. Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who spent some time in the United States in the early 19th century wrote a book that is now a classic of American political science called Democracy in America. There's a significant chapter in that book that talks about the three races in America. The three races at that time, according to the Tocqueville, were white people, African, Africans or people of African descent, and Native Americans, then called Indians. There was no reference at all to Asian Americans or to other people of color, because at that time, they were not even on the radar screen. Now, interestingly enough, if you go back and look at de Tocqueville's vision of America, he said that race was a central problem that threatened this country. And he doubted if black people and white people could ever live together as equals in this country. And he saw the possibility of a race war sometime in the future. And although de Tocqueville bought into the views about people of African descent that dominated that time, that is, views that can be described only as racism, we cannot dismiss the threat that he talked about because this country, at times, seems to stand on the brink of coming apart at the seams on issues of race, even while at the same time we are always trying to sweep under the rug issues of race and ethnicity. The core of America's dilemma on the issue of race is the black-white divide. I don't say that to take issue with Angela O, oh, uh, someone I know and respect, uh, because she is correct that the Race Commission should look at its charge with a broader perspective and should bring to it a concern about race as it affects all of the various ethnic groups in this country. And when I say that the core of the race issue in this country is the black-white divide, black -white divide, that doesn't mean that the black-white divide issue has any primacy in terms of its call to our attention. It doesn't mean that there's any more uh, important a moral question in that divide than there is with respect to race or ethnicity as it, it, it is applied to any other group. I'm not saying that the issue of race when it comes to blacks and whites is more important than the issue of race or ethnicity, more broadly speaking. But I'm saying that in this country, we fought a civil war about the issue of slavery. 
we felt at the beginning of this country, the Constitution itself was a compromise on the issue of slavery, which left the unfinished business that it took a civil war to attempt to resolve, and it took a civil rights movement to further attempt to resolve, and that we are still trying to attempt to resolve today. Even though I believe that that divide continues to be the central question, it is not more important. If we are to find common ground as Americans, as people living in America, whether we're citizens or not, it must be on the ground of principle. It is not enough to oppose racism because we happen to find ourselves as the victims of racism. We must oppose racism because we think it is wrong and that is to say that we must oppose racism no matter who is at the giving end of racism and no matter who is at the receiving end. And that means that we must oppose racism both outside of our communities and racism within our communities. We must oppose racism as a matter of principle. But we know that for the most part, human beings don't act on principle or purely on principle. There's nothing, there's no greater motivator than self-interest. And I don't think that we should deny the importance of self-interest or shrink away from it. But I think we must rise above self-interest and try to find common ground uh, among our different ethnicities, races, religious groups, genders, all of the things that characterize us as a matter of accident of birth, uh, but that are really not pertinent to the core of our souls and who we are and what we are as people. I don't mean to suggest that they're not relevant, but they ultimately don't define the most important and significant things about us, I believe, and that is why we are against being defined solely on the basis of race or ethnicity, religion, and gender. Now, in the world of, of in the real world, in the pragmatic world, in the world of self-interest, we know that there are tensions between various ethnic groups. There are black-white tensions, black-Jewish tensions, black-Latino tensions, black-Korean tensions, black-Asian tensions more broadly. Uh, there are white-Latino tensions, white-Asian-American uh, uh, tensions. There are tensions between Asian-Americans and Latinos. Any group that we could possibly think about, that's only a small list of the lineups of tensions. We can find tensions between them. In New York City, here in New York, of course, we are no strangers to those tensions. A few years back, there was a boycott that grew out of an incident at a Korean grocery on Church Avenue in Brooklyn. And I must say that there were people in both communities, that is the Korean American community, in the African-American community that worked hard to either resolve that conflict or in the aftermath of that conflict to build a better common ground. But there were people who also did not work very hard uh, to find common ground and who did not stand on principle. There was, there was an article not long ago in the New York Times about the mayoral race here in New York and about Al Sharpton, some of you may have seen it, going to a dinner uh, that was sponsored by a Korean-American organization. And Al Sharpton apparently was well received at this dinner. Uh, but the New York Times piece, and I don't believe everything I read in the paper, the New York Times piece talked about how unseemly, or referenced in, a, in an implicit way, how unseemly it was that Al Sharpton, given his history, and referenced the Korean boy, uh, the, the Korean uh, store boycott on Church Avenue uh, would be in this environment and trying to rise above racial appeals, uh, but it indicated that he was warmly received. Uh, Vernon Mason, who some of you may remember, uh, who uh, was a lawyer before being uh, disbarred and an activist in the African American community and, and was known around the Tawana Brawley case because he represented Tawana Brawley. Uh, apparently, according to the New York, New York Times article, has put a lot of time and attention into building 
uh, relationships between the African American and the Korean American community uh, recently. He is now enrolled at uh, the uh, Union Theological Seminary and made a friendship, became very close to a Korean American there who was also studying for the ministry and has <coughs> grown beyond, uh, I think, the perspective that he had some years back and is looking to build multi-ethnic coalitions so that there's always the possibility of all of us growing. I don't mean to suggest that Vernon Mason uh, did not share a broader perspective before he went, but certainly that's where his, his emphasis is there now at the, at, the, uh, at the seminary, according to this article. We must acknowledge that in the aftermath of the Church Avenue boycott, that there have been people working hard to build bridges between the African American and Korean American communities in New York. At the same time, we must acknowledge that there is a lot of prejudice born out of deep, <coughs> deep ignorance in both the African American and the Korean American communities that at any time threatens the well-being of each of those communities and the relationships between those communities. Uh, there's fear among Korean Americans who operate stores in African American neighborhoods, fear of crime, but of course there's fear of crime among African Americans also. There's fear particularly on the part of people who operate those stores because they believe that that crime may somehow be related to prejudices, to misunderstandings, to bias. And that is always a possibility. At the same time, you hear African Americans complaining about being treated rudely uh, in some of the stores and not being hired, even though the stores are in black communities. Uh, and those are issues also that require a sensitivity on the part of people who are operating, admittedly, family-owned businesses, employing people within the family, and at the same time, finding themselves in a community which is predominantly African American. Uh, anyone who operates a business in a community uh, which is uh, uh, composed predominantly of another ethnic or racial group should probably think about whether it would be wise to hire some of the people from that community. Uh, but whether or not one does that, certainly there's going to be, uh, uh, I think, uh, a lot of good uh, born from working with people in that community uh, in a conscious way uh, to build relationships within those communities. But it's a two-way street. Uh, there are African Americans who treat Korean Americans who own those stores in a hostile way because they are frustrated by their inability to find the capital to start their own businesses because they see those stores somehow as exploiting uh, the African American communities when in fact uh, they are providing services uh, and because sometimes they simply are carrying the kinds of frustrations and bitterness because of the conditions in which they find themselves that find their way out uh, and when they are channeled aggressively against anybody who looks different and who is present in those communities that still suffer from the pathologies that are a function in part of continuing discrimination but also long-standing generations of discrimination and their present day effects. And that is a very, very complex phenomenon. Now, I want to shift and say that I think that we have to find common ground and there's no more important place right now at this moment to find common ground on issues like affirmative action. Uh, Margaret has already talked about the ways in which affirmative action is being used as a wedge issue between the African American and the Asian American communities. More specifically, I know out in California in the aftermath of Proposition 209, and at the time actually the 209 was on the ballot, there was a not so subtle message being delivered to Asian Americans. And the message was that after Proposition 209, because you will see fewer black folks and Latinos, and because we'll use test scores and Asian Americans perform higher on test scores or better on test scores, you will find that your numbers will increase at the University of California. Now, 
I remember when I was living out in Los Angeles a few years back working for the Legal Defense Fund when we started an L.A. office, that a memorandum leak from UCLA, the admissions office, I don't know if you remember this memorandum, uh, Margaret, but it was a memorandum that was written by uh, a Caucasian American who worked in the admissions office, and the memorandum complained about what was happening well, with affirmative action on one side, pressing upon the UC system, the admission of African Americans and Latinos who might have had lower test scores. And on the other side, Asian Americans performed very well on tests, standardized tests. And in the middle, white people were being uh, squeezed out, according to him, of UCLA. And he was saying that we have to do something about this. Now, he didn't say, let the chips fall where they may on tests, and if Asian Americans perform better, and there are more of them, that's all right. What he said was, in the memorandum in so many words, we have to protect the, the presence of white people at UCLA. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's self-evident. Uh, but there are a few things that I want to draw out here. Uh, there are people who are using the issue of affirmative action uh, and who hold up standardized test performances uh, as the sole measure of merit uh, as a wage between our community. I think that we have to fight against that wage. First of all, I recognize, although many people do not, uh, that there is not one Asian American community in the United States, that there are differences between those who come from Korea, who come from Vietnam, who come from Cambodia, who come from Japan. That's not to say there isn't an Asian American community that has common interests. I think there is. But uh, the the performances on standardized tests, regardless of race, are in part a function of income, of family income. The strongest correlation between SAT score and any other factor is income of parents. Now that's not to say that some groups may not do better, but I'm saying that there are than other groups, but I'm saying that on these standardized tests, there are a number of factors which explain the different experiences in terms of levels of performance. But most significantly, standardized test scores are not the sum total of any individual's worth, merit, ability, and should not be used as the sole measure of who gets life's opportunities, particularly at these high stakes institutions. While they may be used at the extremes to weed out those who are obviously unqualified, and they may tell us something about the relatively few of us who may be geniuses, most of us fall in the middle. And in that band, the level of different differentiation is not as big as those who are using these tests as a way of driving a wedge between African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans would report that they are. Now, I wish I could say a lot more about that because it is so important that we understand this issue at a time when this testocracy that America is committing itself to is continuing to open up the divide between the haves and the have-nots, and that's accentuated along racial lines. And I hope that we all think about that. Affirmative action is not about unqualified people being given opportunities over people who are qualified. It is about fairness. It's about recognition that the light of opportunity doesn't shine equally in all the places in this country. And therefore, we must make special efforts to make sure that we shine it in the places where it otherwise would not go. And we look beyond the simple numbers uh, which indicate that somebody may have some level of ability or predilection at least toward taking a test for a few hours on a Saturday morning and doing very well on it uh, in that particular kind of measurement of intellect and ability. That we must look beyond that. And affirmative action is in part about that. Now. We have a case in Texas called the Hopwood case, some of you may have heard about, which is uh, producing uh, a University of Texas law school that looks very much like, or will look very much like the law school that Thurgood Marshall and the Legal Defense Fund sued in the late 1940s when there was a rule against black folks attending. Uh, only uh, a handful of African American students, actually I think only one enrolled, uh, uh, no, that, maybe that's uh, Berkeley, but only a handful of enrolled in the first year class. Uh, and 
uh, if that continues, we'll see that school become virtually all white, as it once was. Uh, a few weeks ago, Lena Gralia, a law school faculty member down there, made a statement about black and Latino people having a culture which encourages failure. And he talked about white people not having to mix with the lower classes, presumably meaning people of color. That is what is happening at these institutions. Even though there may be people who raise good faith questions about affirmative action, part of this is the old antagonism against African Americans and against Latinos. And if you think that that is an antagonism that is limited to Latinos and African Americans and does not, does not apply to Asian Americans, then I think that we have to go back and look at history a little bit more closely. Now, uh, Proposition 209, which I don't need to tell you about, is being replicated, or there's a threat of replication around the country. The president went to Houston the day after he spoke in Little Rock and spoke about a city council uh, a proposal to put a Proposition 209 type measure on the ballot there in the city of Houston. There are 26 states lined up between, behind California waiting to see what happens in the Supreme Court with their own Proposition 209 measures. Uh, Margaret has talked about the issues of electoral politics. Uh, I just say that I've watched as uh, a certain city council member in Flushing has uh, spoken about the influx of Asian Americans, and particularly Korean Americans, into that community uh, in a way uh, that promotes the kind of racism and antagonism uh, that we all think should be put in the uh, trash heap of history. Uh, and she is afraid, she is afraid of Asian American voting strength uh, putting her out of office. I encourage, I don't need to encourage, I'm not part of the Asian American community, you know better than I do, but I encourage all of you to register and vote and to turn her out at the earliest opportunity. Now, uh, I want to make a, a, a few uh, suggestions in closing as I was asking you about what we can do uh, specifically to work together in multi-ethnic coalitions. First, I think we have to study history. It is indivisible. And when I mean, what I mean by that is that there really is no such thing as black history. I always cringe when we have black history. There's no such thing as black history. Uh, people thought up the necessity of Black History Month because black people were being ignored in the history lessons that were being taught in class. But there's only history, and it's indivisible. One can't understand European history in the 14th and 15th, 16th century, 17th century, without understanding what was happening with the slave trade in Africa, or for that matter, what was happening uh, with uh, the trade uh, in the Far East, as it was called. One can't understand that. We are living in a world that is no longer divisible uh, because of the advances of technology, travel, the internet, etc. But history, in fact, was never divisible. And so we have to study history because when we study history, then we can understand the experiences of different groups, groups that are not our own. And then we will be in a position to better understand what experiences they bring to this country. And so that for new immigrants to this country, they will understand the old black-white divide. For African Americans in this country, we can understand the experience of Korean Americans, Asian Americans, of people coming from uh, the West Indies, people who come from Eastern Europe, have a better understanding of what issues they bring to this country. Second, stand up against racism, uh, even within our own communities. What do I mean by that? Well, obviously we have to stand up against racism perpetuated against us, or perpetrated against us uh, from outside our communities. But within our communities, we all know when we hear the statements that are directed at others outside of our communities that we know are wrong, that we are uncomfortable with inside but we may not speak out against because we go along to get along. That is wrong and insidious, 
and we must stand up against it at any time. We must also join hands with our other communities when they are under attack, so that when the call came out to join uh, at the demonstration against the uh, uh, National Review, uh, those of us from the African American communities, Latino American communities were there. Uh, and when the Abdel Awima incident took place, as Margaret pointed out, people from the Asian American community uh, were there at the demonstration uh, at City Hall. Because again, our commitment must be to principle, not solely to self-interest. Third, join and, uh, and support progressive organizations uh, that work in multiracial coalitions. There are organizations that work only within their communities and that are antagonistic to groups outside of their communities. And in my view, those organizations, although the people in them may be very effective voices for people within those communities in some respects, do a disservice in a larger respect. We must work together with organizations that reach out across multi-ethnic uh, boundaries. Uh, and uh, in the Legal Defense Fund, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, uh, and uh, other groups, we do that all the time. Uh, we have specific examples of how we have done that, which I don't have time to tell, but I think that that is important. Fourth, work to find common ground. Now sometimes there's going to be disagreement. Sometimes self-interest is going to mean that we cannot abandon those disagreements. Where those disagreements are unavoidable, I think we must respect those disagreements and understand them, no matter how intensely we disagree. And we must work against the tendency for people in our communities who are less well-informed to use those disagreements as a breeding ground for bias, because that is a fertile ground for the kind of antagonisms that we can easily avoid if we have a more enlightened approach. Uh, so that is a very important point. Fifth, I believe that we should drop the term and refute the term, reject the term minority. Because the term minority in this country really is about empowerment. It reflects who's empowered and who isn't. When we hear women referred to as a minority group, that is an indication that it is not really about numbers because women are a majority in this country. It is about power. And we know that within the 21st century, there's no longer going to be a majority group in this country. We're close to that now. Uh, the notion of being a minority, I think, stamps on, within our, our minds a notion of disempowerment, which, which we must reject. We must form coalitions uh, that put us in a position where we view ourselves as, at any given time, part of a majority, or at least able to get our agenda across, even if our numbers are somewhat smaller. But everyone in this country, white males in particular, are part of a minority group. So that term doesn't help us. It also obscures differences within or between our communities. What do I mean by that? Well, when I talked about how a wedge is being driven by some between black people and Asian Americans, sometimes you'll see people talk about how minorities are uh, uh, present within an institution or an employer has them uh, within uh, the job place in relatively significant numbers. And then when you break down what those numbers are, it may be that there are Num uh, significant numbers, for example, uh, at Bolt Hall of Asian Americans, but African Americans are being shoved out, uh, and that's being obscured. So the term minority also obscures sometimes important uh, facts that we have to dig to and get uh, and, and lay out. Finally, I believe that we have to support programs and policies that open up opportunities to all people. What I mean by that, of course, is a reference to affirmative action. But it's very simple. 
in a debate in which there's a dialogue in which black is white, up is down, uh, people who are opposed to affirmative action and opportunity are using the language of the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, uh, and they're saying color blindness is the name of the game. But the bottom line to me is, does your policy open up opportunity for all people, or does it close them down for some? I think we have to support the ones that open up opportunities for all people. And I thank you for your patience. My time is up. <laughs> and uh, look forward to working with you in the future.
and, and then come back for, come back refreshed uh, for question and answer and also comments and discussion. Um, I'm sure everyone, if uh, everyone has questions and comments brewing uh, in their heads right now, it's been a very enriching uh, presentation. Um, our final speaker, speaker, Min Chung, is a board member of, of NACASAC as well as its um, Los Angeles affiliate, which is the largest affiliate um, that we have, and it's also the first one uh, which acted as kind of the, the mother organization. Um, they also um, uh, should be congratulated because after a long uh, capital campaign, they just bought a, a beautiful, beautiful center in Los Angeles and, and um, on the edge of Koreatown. Um, so we're very happy to share that with you. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that Min Chung has been one of those board members who, uh, whose leadership um, and whose, whose um, really the ability to challenge staff and other board members have really brought us to <laughs> where we are. Um, so he will bring a unique Korean American perspective um, uh, uh, to this multi-ethnic coalition building because the, uh, the sponsoring organization is, is a Korean organization. So go ahead, Min. <laughs> well, I'm really a little of something of a bind here, uh, not just because of time, but um, I like to say that I listened uh, the other speakers' presentation with uh, fascination and intense interest. Uh, I learned a great deal um, this morning, and I just like to just go on and just listen to uh, listen uh, you know, them speak and learn more about it rather than talk about my stuff. Um, and another thing is that since they've spoken about so many important issues uh, so clearly and so eloquently, that uh, I, you know, they took many of the words out of my mouth. So, uh, may be repetitive uh, if I go on with my presentation. We'll let you know. And, <laughs> and another thing is uh, now I'm going to have to change every word in my presentation minority to people of color. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a real challenge here within 10 minutes. But um, at the risk of uh, being repetitive, uh, I will break my presentation. Uh, bear with me. Um, before I go and talk about the Korean community, um, I, there's a couple of things I'd like to share with you on um, the racial relations uh, in this country, uh, present and future. Um, the one, the first thing is that um, that there's no question that we're living in a uh, rapidly changing world, and although no one seems to know where this rapidly changing will lead us to, and. One of the most um, important cause of that rapid change is the end of Cold War. Um, and in regard to the issues of the right of people of color and immigrants in the United States, I see many parallels with what's going on today and the nation's betrayal to African American people after construction, after the Civil War although those events are centuries apart. If the civil rights gains of the colored people after the Civil War took in the context of the Northern industrialized need to check the rebellious Southern white landowners, the tremendous strides community of color and immigrant communities made since the 1960s took place in the context of ruling class need to pacify the dissent from within in the face of very serious challenges and competition from socialist forces in and out of the United States. Just as white America betrayed the people of color after the reconstruction was over, the US, or the white part of it, may be about to betray the people of color and immigrants now that Cold War is over. I believe this is a very important factor that we must consider when thinking about the strategies of the civil rights struggle and race relations in the present and the coming age. For example, the strategies of the civil rights movement in the 1960s may or may not work 
and has fundamentally changed international and domestic political environment. And another fallout from the end of Cold War is essentially unchecked global globalization of capitalism or market economy <coughs> based on the European ideology of culture, uh, meritocracy, and individualism. As the production ma machines of the market economy expands beyond all national and cultural boundaries, the US and the advanced industrial nations, the nerve centers of the, this gigantic machines, are making rapid transition <coughs> from uh, to the economy dominated by information, knowledge, and service industries. The whole classes of jobs are disappearing due to this profound structural changes that's going on in America as well as other advanced nations. More and more, there is a widening gap in the living standards of the highly educated and the unskilled. With the booming Wall Street, for example, there are definitely are tremendous bonanzas of the peace dividend to be found, but most undereducated and underprivileged Americans do not see or get it. And as for someone who live in the Korea town of LA, but work in the software industry of the West San Fernando Valley, I see this reality every day firsthand. While the high-tech and entertainment industry of the Los Angeles area are ex experiencing rapid growth and newly found prosperity, the Korea town is in the deepest recession ever. And there's a real poverty and desperation in Korea town of LA, especially among the elderly, single mother household, and the recent immigrants. And this phenomenon is not limited to Korea towns or Los Angeles. You find the same pattern in every minority or people of color neighborhood in every city. I believe the struggle for better life and economic justice must take these profound changes into account. After all, what's good is working hard to push for good paying jobs if those jobs are rapidly disappearing. Ex especially access to high quality education and job training must be an integral part of the struggle as well as demand for equitable pay for unskilled workers. And on the other hand, uh, this is something that many speakers have talked about already, that there's a significant uh, changes taking place in the U.S. demographics. According to the U.S. Census Bureau projection, by uh, the year 2050, uh, nearly 50% of the population of the United States will be the people of color. This, present, this presents us with tremendous challenges of building a truly equal and just multiracial society if we were to survive as one nation. At the same time, if we can build effective coalitions the people of color have no chance to affect real changes in America for the first time in its history. Of course, there are many formidable forces who do not want to see this happen. Among them are the current anti-immigrant forces of today. And this is why the anti-immigrant anti forces attack immigrants and immigration, attempt to divide, and divide the native-born born people of color from immigrant communities, and attack immigrant citizenship rights and voting rights. And, and these are the three general things that I've been thinking about of the issues of race relations, uh, present and future. And um, let me now just briefly talk about the Korean community and Korean uh, immigrant experience. And um, I didn't put a lot of depth into this uh, presentation, this part of it, because uh, many of the uh, list uh, audiences uh, are Korean Americans, Korean immigrants, and uh, this would be much, much more of an introduction uh, to the people who is not familiar with uh, the Korean community that well. But after speak, uh, hearing the other speakers to uh, the presentation, I felt that uh, I'm ob obligated to spend a little more time on the, uh, the origin and the status of the Korean American uh, community so that uh, we can share some of this understanding and perhaps begin uh, you know, 
at least one of the processes of understanding. The first thing is that uh, the Korean community, Korean uh, American community, is predominantly immigrant population, about 80% of them are uh, not US born, but with growing uh, 1.5 second generation Korean Americans. And if you look at the Census Bureau statistics of, of uh, when they came, uh, you see a sudden jump around 1975 and nearly a sudden drop early 1990s. And this uh, jump and drop of Korean immigration to the United States exactly, almost exactly overlap the political changes in South Korea. Those are the days from 1975 to 19, uh, early 1990s were the darkest days of South Korean uh, dictatorship. Those were the days when the South Korea is ruled by uh, staunchly anti-communist military dictatorship, um, and which I'm very familiar with because I grew up in that uh, period. So, just just looking at the immigration pattern of Koreans to the United States, you can judge that um, the, the nature of Korean immigration to the United States is essentially political and economic refugee. Although they may have not come in such a dramatic uh, environment uh, or circumstances as uh, Vietnamese or South State, East Asians. And the environment where they came from, uh, they have very little political experience in modern democracy because they were living under a dictatorship where there is no real political uh, liberty. On the top of that, uh, Korea, as all you all know, um, is a divided country since 1945, and still remains so. And uh, 1945 was one of the uh, peaks of the Cold War confrontation, uh, where the United States and the uh, Soviet Union divided Korea um, and took uh, each half of it. And South Korea, as we all know, uh, came under uh, U.S. Uh, side. And at this height of Cold War confrontation, Korea became a, the most contended place for ideology. And uh, South, in South Korea, anti-communism indoctrination was the life of the day. Um, I remember when I was growing up, then in art class, I was uh, told to draw a uh, North Korean. And he looked like a demonic figure with horns and you know, hairs coming out of hand. And many of us believed, really, in school age, that North Koreans looked like that, that they were demonic people. Uh, that keeps an indication of the, the indoctrination and ferocity of uh, political climate at, at that time. But the anti-communism uh, indoctrination didn't come uh, alone. It came with baggage. And the, the baggage is the ideology of white supremacy. Basically, to give, it, give you an example, the name um, America, the nation, trans in, in um, Korean is trans can be translated directly into beautiful nation. And in this indoctrination, forceful indoctrination environment, the beauty did not mean color. The beautiful nation, America, was white. It was very clear to us that this was so. So that in the immigration wave of 1970s, when you have this uh, basically desperate people from a essentially socially traumatized group uh, fleeing from the harsh dictatorship, uh, you have people, group of people who has little political experience, who has indoctrination of anti-communist ideas based on white supremacy. And this may explain uh, some of the problems you, you are seeing uh, in Korean uh, African American relations, for example. So that Korean immigrant portrayed during the 1992 um, people in LA, they were portrayed as insular shop owners with guns to protect their property. It it was a myth, and it was. A really totally unfair portray portrayal, but it did have some basis in truth and reality, as all myths do.
And the second uh, thing about uh, Korean community is that about 60% of the population has limited proficiency in English. So that um, the Koreans who came to this country, who know who knew, knowing little about uh, American history other than the white history of Indian con conquest, um, they had no means to learn about any other part of the American history, especially the people of color, because even the scanned materials available was in English, and th those were not approachable to many Koreans. So there was a real problem of communication information there. And the third thing that I talk about Korean American community is that the size, uh, the total population is about 1.5 million, um, and that is about 0.5%, uh, less than a half, it's about half a percent of the entire US population. So for, for whatever the Korean uh, community wants to do, to get itself out of this um, attack uh, of being wedged between um, different races and classes, uh, you cannot do that or you cannot change society or impact policies alone due to its own size. So it's critically important for Korean American communities to build multi ethnic uh, coalitions. And we at NACASEC uh, consider multi-ethnic coaching building as one of the primary objectives of the organization. And having said that, um, let me just go back to this uh, model minority myth that many of uh, speakers have talked about. And for Koreans and Korean Americans, model minority myth isn't just myth and even something of a compliment. It costed us very dearly. The high-profile focus in so-called Black-Korean conflict during the LA upheaval of 1992 shows you how dangerous this stigma can be uh, to Korean Americans and to any um, people of color groups. And the current, uh, even uh, to go even further, the current deep recession um, in Koreatown in LA and Chicago and New York in the midst of expansion uh, and the growth of overall US economy shows how misleading this model minority uh, myth is uh, in reality. However, um, you keep hearing that the Asian Americans and Korean Americans have higher average representation in prestige universities and high tech industry. But uh, by definition, uh, these uh, exceptionally talented people are more of exception than norm, precisely because who they are and where they are at. And the whole community cannot be judged by the number of exceptional people. For example, you never hear that the whites uh, judge the welfare of the um, white uh, population by counting number of whites in Harvard or Yale or Columbia, etc. <laughs> Nevertheless, the myth persists. And in this age of widening gap of living standards between the highly educated and the unskilled, the Asian Americans and especially Korean Americans who already had the experience of the violence of this being wedged between uh, race and class are once again being set up to take the blame for the failure of the system. And this is despite the fact that the real reality in Korea town, the great majority of the Koreans living in those uh, ethnic enclaves are not benefiting from the high tech boom. And that's deep recession in the Korea town irrefutably show. And um, having said that, uh, I've been you know, asked uh, to make some recommendation as to how we can build more uh, effective multi-ethnic uh, coalition. And I can, I really strongly second uh, Ted Shaw's um, recommendation that studying history is, is extremely important. And it, uh, it put, it's, and uh, especially the, we at NACASEC has already been carrying out some of these programs. We have developed 
program, programs on African American and Latin American and Asian American history to educate Koreans and Korean, Korean immigrants and Korean uh, Americans. But more than that, what's really needed uh, in the Korean community is to develop uh, these materials in Korean language because many of those uh, people in the Korea town, the people who operate shops in black community or Latino community are uh, those one, among those people whose English uh, is not very proficient. So uh, they won't be able to uh, read English materials even if they had the time. So it's, it's very important to develop uh, materials in Korean language, uh, talk about African American history, their struggle, Latin Americans, Asian Americans uh, struggle, and to show them the commonality of their history and struggle. And not just make a few hundred copies of this, but make hundred thousands of copies of them and distribute uh, all over the place in Korean, in Korean community. Another um, recommendation I could make is to develop, develop a multi-racial and multicultural sensitivity training program for Koreans and Korean American uh, community uh, within ourselves. That could include multicultural exchange programs. And lastly, um, as all of the speakers have uh, said, that we need to develop a comprehensive strategy for common goals with other, other communities. The great upheaval of 1992 in Los Angeles, also uh, called uh, Saigu among Korean Americans, was a multiracial expression of the outrage against social injustice that was accumulated over many years. 